Hey, Big Clive, what's that you got? Is that one of those big, huge, scary cameras that hangs from the ceiling and rotates automatically every so often as if it's watching you while blinking a menacing red light? Oh, I rather think it is. And you know what? I think we should take this to bits right now. So let's start by looking at the case, and the case is vacuum formed out of white plastic and then it's had all these sort of trims stuck on and these are also vac formed. And the whole thing is stuck together with a mixture of plastic solvents of glue and um, hot melt glue. And this is a quite, this this is ancient, you can see it's all discoloured over time and it's also gone very brittle and it's uh, quite sort of fragile. And if I turn it over now, as you'll see it's filthy inside, oh look that dust has just come out of it, that's quite annoying. Um, it has the these sort of plastic trims, again vac formed, very soft, flexible, uh, and they've just been stuck all around it. And each of these has or had a little plastic lens at the back, and it's not, the lens is rattling loose. Uh, is there a screwdriver here? Let's uh, pop that off. So there's a little plastic ring holding in this lens. Oop, that should do it. And the lens itself is, it actually looks like it's moulded resin. It looks like that is basically just a puddle of resin that's been poured into a mould. It's so rough at the edges. Either that or it's a plastic lens that they've nibbled all around the edge, which is possible, but it, it has that sort of yellowy resin look. And I'm guessing the reason that's held in uh, by the little plastic ring glued on there is because if they put the glue in the back that would give it a, that would sort of spoil the optical effect that you know of the sort of depth that you get uh, if you put the glue in the back it would just make a seal and it would just look at a black lens so this gives that strange reflective optical effect which is what they're looking for because they're trying to pretend there's a camera in here however there is a camera in this unit and if you see where the this one is this is obviously supplied with one of these fake lenses in every single position. I guess, you know, they probably do. A, a, probably a lot of these just have no cameras at all. But in this case, uh, the uh, this one, they've taken a knife and they've just cut round it and pulled that off. And there is a camera inside pointing out through that orifice. I should also mention the outside, we've got this grey plastic, but it's very clear that all these vac forms are just slightly different because this bit of grey plastic doesn't really fit into this too well. It's not going in easily, so they must just it all be fouled and adjusted just to fit. And then there's wee dabs of glue at the edge to hold them in. The other bit of plastic, oh look at the mess that's made, that's quite annoying. I'm going to have to clean that up. Is uh, this, this is the bit that sits on top and it's also cracking with age. And all it is, it's just a, a plastic shell of vac form that it just physically sits inside the other one. On, on a lip, and that's what uh, holds, you know, it just sits and just hides spots, you know, it adds the final bit of trim on top. I should also mention that the camera itself, which I'll be bringing up shortly, is the, the main supporting structure, and then this is just hooked on with these little lips here. There's a lip at this side, and a lip at the other, and these just hook onto metal frames. So this is really just a sort of floating trim. And the light uh, is just through this hole in the middle, which is reinforced by an extra layer of plastic, possibly just to make it thick enough so they could actually get the things screwed on properly. But um, let's take a look at the guts now. Oh, look, that is filthy. Yeah, that's annoying. That's my lovely new work surface, and it's manky already. So here's what's inside, and we'll take a closer look at this, but I'll bring the camera down a bit for this uh, once we've actually taken a look at the outside. And this set uh, suspends on what looks suspicious of like 20mm conduit, so I got a, a 20mm bush and screwed it in, and yes, that's 20mm conduit. So I uh, suppose that means it's a, it's a handy source for uh, the hardware for hanging it. <clears throat> so this is the... Uh, the well, let's take a look. Actually, I'll show you that afterwards. The main thing is that there's a camera under here. A really vintage camera. That's the real lens you can see poking out the front. Uh, which, rather oddly, has just a single core coming out of it. And uh, this thing uses the mains earth as a, a common for part of its control signals. And I'm wondering if they actually ran the video along using the earth, the mains earth, as the video common as well. Because... Um, this just seems to have a single core, and um, I'm guessing then, yeah, that's just, I'm guessing that if they use the mains earth as the video 
ground, that's going to potentially introduce uh, a lot of ripple into the picture. But then having said that, the picture would probably be shit in this thing anyway. Um, so anything worthy of note? We've got the mains in here. We've got uh, sort of live neutral earth in this super thin wire. A, a little earth connection onto the casing, which is nice. That's good. And we've got an extra red and yellow wire here. And that is used, and it's bell wire again. That is used for actually taking control of it, for actually panning it left or right manually from a remote uh, location. And that is just, you stick these wires onto the metal housing, it is just basically using earth again, mains earth, as one of the commons. And that pans it in either direction, or if you touch both on at once, it just stops it, it overrides the facility for the unit to move itself. And the unit will just move itself uh, automatically. It'll just pan round backwards and forwards, uh, thanks to this circuit board. But tell you what, uh, this camera at the bottom really takes up a lot of space. So I'm going to pause, I'm going to move the camera, this camera here down, and we can take a closer look at this. So here's uh, the unit now that I've removed the camera off it, and that's a good thing because the camera weighed quite a lot. And we can now see the mechanism it's running here. And it's actually rotating this shaft, which effectively, because the shaft's static, because the unit's suspended from it, it would then uh, rotate the, the body with the whole camera assembly on the bottom. This is the uh, control, and this is a... It always runs an automatic pilot. If, if nothing's connected, it just runs an automatic pilot itself. If I, uh, in, if I connect one of these wires to ground, it will run in a particular direction until it reaches this end limit and hits these switches here. And then it will stop. And if you run it the other direction, with the other wire, it would then rotate round to the other side until it hit this limit. And that would stop it as well. It takes a modest amount of pressure to hit, push these in, but there's a reason for that. If you put both connect both of these to the chassis, then you'll probably hear uh, the control relay for the automatic panning mode. There, it's just clicked there, uh, clicking and out, <clears throat> but nothing will happen because it, that overrides it. The motor itself is a mains synchronous AC motor with this uh, 100 nanofarad 400 volt capacitor, a really big uh, bipolar dielectric, which is a bit of a monster. That would probably be quite messy when it failed. Um, and the motor itself is running. The reason for that capacitor direction, I'll show you that afterwards. I'm going to have to be careful here, it's all live. Uh, the motor is the, driving that small um, wheel there, driving onto the, the main body, the main sort of uh, gear tooth that then drives the whole thing around. So let's... Uh, Let's unplug this now so we can take a closer look at the circuit board and how this uh, assembly, this motor uh, mechanism works. So unplug that, make sure I have unplugged the right thing there. That would be quite unpleasant. At least there's a little warning light. The warning light plugs in to two little jack socket, little banana sub plugs. That's odd. I suppose it means that, you know, uh, that may, does make sense. It means that, you know, that it's already built into the plastic housing and when you actually put the thing together and hook it all together, all you have to do then is fish these wires up and plug them in. The way the motor works, um, I need a notepad. Notepad. These synchronous motors have three terminals, the uh, bi-directional ones. I'm just going to move that back out the way a wee bit. And in this case, it's got the common neutral at one end, and then one winding. The other winding here. So that's the common neutral, and that's probably just connected to neutral all the time, I'd think. And then it's got two terminals and a capacitor. In this case, it's at 100 nanofarad, 400 volts. I'll just write that next to 100 nano, 400 volts, scary, dial uh, scary electrolytic connected across it. Now, this means that, uh, say for instance, I call this, uh, say this is clockwise and this is counterclockwise. If I apply the live to clockwise, then 
this coil is just powered directly from the mains, but this one here uh, has a slight phase shift introduced by the fact there's this capacitor in series with it, because current can still go through that capacitor and then through that coil, and that's what gives it one direction. If I in instead power it from this terminal, if I connect live to this terminal, then this winding is in phase with the mains, and this one has that slight phase shift caused by the capacitor. So it's very simple. It means that just alternating between these two windings uh, controls the direction. Let's make sure I'm still in shot here. Yes, I am. Uh, the, to operate this, this then has a extra switch on there. This is on the, this assembly itself. And these switches are the limit switches. And then that goes to the control board for clockwise and counterclockwise. And what that means is that when you power it to go in the clockwise direction, that uh, little stem here hits this switch when it's traveled too far, and that effectively breaks the circuit to that, so that it can't, it, the motor can't run any further. As soon as it reaches the end of the limit, instead of just stalling, it will actually break the circuit. But because this limit is still uh, intact, because uh, it's switched another direction, if you then switch to counterclockwise, uh, then that limit will allow current through and the motor can run the opposite direction. That's just basically it's an end of travel limit switch. However, there is another terminal in this and it's auto. And this is where it gets quite clever. And the auto is another switch and it doesn't, it acts as its own limit. And the auto is the one that when it's panning about randomly itself, it uh, switches on and off. So all that happens, the auto just gets fed five seconds on, about 15 seconds off. And say the switch is in the clockwise direction, then when the power is applied to auto, it will just run the thing in clockwise direction until it reaches the end limit and hits the switch. And the interesting thing about this, and the reason it was a wee bit stiffer earlier, is because the limit switch in this, let's bring this in, the bottom limit switch here is so it, it's designed with this uh, spring-loaded um, sort of adjuster here that it holds its memory. If, if I push this in, the sw top switch here, the uh, actual physical rotation limit switch for when it's under manual control, the two top switches are for that, one for one direction, one for the other. But the bottom switch, it's just kind of set up in a quite a clever way with a little pad that when you move it in one direction, it kind of stores that last setting, so to speak. And when you move it in this direction, it doesn't quite release. So that if I press this now very gently, you'll hear a slight click. So this is being, the bottom switch is being used as a direction memory. So when it's in automatic mode, there's no sophisticated electronics involved in that. It just, the switch is stuck in its last position until it's nudged in the opposite direction when the camera reaches the end of travel. So what's going to happen there in automatic mode is it's going to go around in segments on the timer until it reaches the end of travel and then it will just reverse and then it will just go around in segments in the opposite direction. And there, I thought maybe it would do random sort of directions, but it doesn't. It's not that sophisticated, but I suppose it's functional. It means it covers pretty, it, it achieves movement, which is what they're wanting. The circuit board has three sections. It's got the transformer, two diodes, and a capacitor and a fuse, and that forms a very basic, unregulated power supply. I'm actually suddenly realising, hope this hasn't been making noise, I haven't put the cable for the microphone around my neck and occasionally tug it, uh, so hopefully that's not been creating noise. The circuitry then has another section, and this controls a blinking LED, I was going to say blinking LED, they didn't have bright LEDs back then, it was a really, uh, it's the blinking lamp, because it was just indicators LED in that, uh, indicator LEDs in that era, they wouldn't have been bright enough. And that's controlled through this, and it's quite odd because it, it glows dimly, courtesy of this resistor just passing enough current to make it glow, and then it just pulses bright. Uh, let me just uh, show you that again, I'll just plug this back in again. At some point this is going to go bang. Right, this is not lighting. It may be going to go bang sooner than we were expecting. Let's uh, see if that lamp... Oh, you know what? I've unplugged the lamp, haven't I? That's why. Bleh. Right, let's try... Uh, let's fish this out and plug the lamp in again. This is low voltage. 
and it's still not going. Well, that's that's a good start. Maybe the the lamp's gubbed. Nope, there it goes. So you can see it's kind of glows, but it just flashes brightly. But it's always glowing. I don't know why they did that. Um, and that is the circuitry in here is doing that. And oh, this thing's now trying to crawl about all over the place. I'll unplug it again. What's actually happening here is that resistor, I don't know if it's part of the timing circuit as well, but it's trickling current to the lamp continually. And then this transistor here, I think, shunts it so that the lamp goes up to full brightness when this uh, circuit sort of reaches its time. And it's just really, it's, it's a, I initially thought it was going to be a, a sort of like a flip-flop type circuit. But um, it's just got a single capacitor that's kind of like threw me a bit there, but it is almost kind of like a flip-flop arrangement, but with a single capacitor. I'm not sure about that. And it seems to be just designed for brief pulses. The two transistors are... Can I read those two transistors? Is this unplugged before I stick my fingers in the live bit? Yes, it is. BC237 and BC337. I'm not sure what that is. The bit that controls the automatic panning is this bit here, and the chip is a MC1455P1, which is a Motorola knockoff of the 555. So it, the, basically, it's a 555, and that's based around uh, this small capacitor here, this capacitor here, and two resistors to set the sort of mark space ratio, so to speak. And that's controlling the automatic mode, really. And that's fundamentally it. The other two relays are just powered by this uh, two-core wire that just uh, goes to ground. And basically speaking, it's the low voltage in this power supply here that provides that power so it's safe. It's not like mains voltage in these. I think it's about 12 volts. And that just powers these uh, relays directly. Um, but they're interlocked. This one has a double pole contact uh, and this one is single pole changeover as is, as is the other one. And just by the way they're wired that uh, each one kind of disconnects the next one along, so to speak. So it's uh, very straightforward. It's quite interesting. The circuit board itself here, let's pop the circuit board out. It has the person who designed it it has their name in the back of it, which is quite interesting. So it was designed by Mark Mercer Electronics. And it's just got that old school sort of, I guess, that era. It wouldn't have been computer graphics, it would have been crepe tape. Or, or the stencils. Uh, the sort of rub-on sort of films that they used for making circuit boards back then. There's also what looked like two snubber networks here, but uh, they're kind of the, the value of the capacitors. Oh, RS components components in this, by the way, which, so it's all very clearly a small quantity, a small run. It looks at uh, 0.0011 kV. Is that 0.001 microfarad? Is that like one nanofarad? I guess it is. Which is quite an odd value, but then it's, again, it's a very low load, this sort of motor. And then the classic 100 ohm resistor. All the uh, relays have a little uh, diode across the coil for back EMF, spike suppression. And that's fundamentally it. It's quite nice that the transistors are marked in the back. 327 and 337. Did I say 237? Oh, right, it is. It's a BC327 and a BC337. So, yeah... Interesting. It's quite a neat thing, really. Um, but very much designed mainly for show and to scare people than actual. You know, I don't reckon that the quality of the picture would have been would have been fantastic from this, particularly given that they looked through smoked plastic as well, which would have attenuated its sensitivity even more. This is also an RS connector. This has been made out of quality components. It must have been quite an expensive thing at, in its time. But yeah, it's quite novel, isn't it? It's quite a neat, quite a neat sort of thing. But, um, so that's what's inside these uh, scary Dalek head cameras. Um, quite amusing really, I quite like this.